Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. For more than 20 years, Benese outside Naoshima has created a unique cultural landscape where the nat nature and local culture of the Seto Inland Sea come in resonance with contemporary art and architecture. Naoshima, Inujima, and Teshima are three islands with a rich historical background. The beautiful landscapes were designated as Japan's first national park, but the impact of Japan's rapid modernization and industrialization since the late 19th century also resulted in environmental problems, depopulation, and eventually the aging of society. Such contradictory reality with preserved natural beauty and damage in the insular setting were in the context of the project. With the initiative of Mr. Fukutake to revitalize the region, the architect, first Mr. Ando, then Mr. Sambuichi and Sana, as well as many artists, including American artists such as Mr. James Tarell, or Mr. Walter de Maria, or Mr. Doug and Mike Stan, or New York-based artists from Asia, like Mr. Sugimoto, Mr. Senju, Mr. Taigo-chan, have created many site-specific artworks and iconic architectures. I'm glad many of them are with us today. Now, these islands with small populations became a sort of art mecca and received a number of visitors from all over the world. However, the site is not a mere leisure destination. It is designed to be inspirational as well as thought-provoking creating an antithesis to the frenzy of life in the world's capital cities. The visitors are invited to immerse themselves in art and nature, as well as engage in the critical thinking and dialogue with society, questioning the existing social systems and inventing new ways of life. In order to further develop the reflection about the unique initiative from various perspectives and explore the possibility for our future, we have edited Insular Inside book, not only with the participating architect and artist, but also with sociologists, philosophers, art historians, etc. And discussion forums were held in Europe. Today's symposium is the first such event in the United States. We would like to thank the Japan Society for welcoming us here. Joining us today are the project initiator and the Benesse outside president, Mr. Fukutake. Can you stand up? <laughs> and three participating architects, Ms. Sejima. And Mr. Nishizawa. And Mr. Sambuichi. as well as Harvard University professor, Ms. Blau. First, there will be a short video presentation of the site. Then Mr. Fukutake will speak about the historical development and the underlying philosophy of the project. Although not being physically present here, Mr. Ando will speak about his environment in Naoshima through video. After that, Three architects will speak about their individual realizations and ongoing project. This will be followed by a discussion moderated by Professor Blau. Professor Blau contributed the text Architecture as Instrument in the Insula Insight book. Today's session will give us an overview of the activity at Benesse outside Naoshima, mainly focusing on the architectural achievement and the significance of the project. This will hopefully offer interesting insight into the relationships developed between art, architecture, and nature, different ideas about museum, and how architecture can play an essential role in regional revitalization, as well as address environmental and societal issues in our globalized age. Japan's architecture, and more widely the Japanese society itself, are standing at a turning point after the Great Eastern Japan earthquake of 2011, with an increased general awareness of the energy and the demographical challenges facing the country, and in the context of a contracting economy, 
Japanese architects also are reconsidering their use of energy and finding new ways to interact with and optimize local resources. The role of architects is becoming increasingly prominent as they are building a new set of relationships with society. The experimentations initiated at the Venice Art Site Naoshima serve as a valuable model from this perspective also. We will not have sufficient time to explore the entire project here, but it is important to note that there are other architectural experimentations undertaken on site, in addition to the project that will be presented to you by today's celebrated architect. One such example is a public bus created by Shinro Otake. All the unused building was transformed for daily use and for the enjoyment of visitors and residents alike. Another example is a contribution of Hiroshi Sugimoto. Sugimoto restored and transformed an old shrine into a work of art. Not only does this contribute to preserve ancient building techniques and materials, but also traditional customs, as the shrine is a place of spiritual importance and plays a prominent role in social interactions in the local community. Other artists prefer to work with local builders and carpenters, as can be seen in Christian Boltanski's case. He chose Teshima as the sole location to permanently host in his archive of human heartbeats collected around the world. Bodansky assimilated contemporary art and museums with medieval relics, churches, or cathedrals, and postulated that art can offer a new kind of spiritual experience. His work is not so much about what there is to see. It is more about experiencing something spiritual, like praying and meditating while listening to someone's heart. Bordansky's own words are a testimony to the diversity of ideas and architectural postulates explored at the Venice Art Site Naoshima. So I would like to close my introduction by sharing his thought with you about his hard archives on Teshima Island. I quote, I had no interest in making art in the traditional sense of the term. The location seemed ideal because of its remoteness and beauty. I did not want the building to override the idea. It's all those people from all over the world whose heartbeats were recorded. It's a story, the mice. If the building had been very beautiful, it would have become a sculpture. I didn't want that. I wanted to create a monument of the spirit, a place of pilgrimage that respect the location and its people without imposing anything. Indeed, a fundamental point to distinguish Naoshima's project from other types of foundations, money is not the key. There are other values. The project speaks to real people and not only to the jet set. There is another dimension here that goes beyond collecting works of art and accompanying financial speculation. That's what makes it similar to the utopia of the 18th century, to the ancient tradition of enhancing nature and making it more beautiful. Thank you very much for your attention. And now let's move to Mr. Hukitake's presentation. Hello, everybody. I am Hukitake. Thank you for the introduction. I would like to and talk a little bit about the development at Naoshima. Please start the slide presentation. Oh, the video. Yes, I'm sorry.
All right, then let me talk about the background of this development and the things I noticed during the process. I think you saw the wonderful video image, but that was Naoshima when it was under development, and this is Inushima. There used to be a refinery here. And uh, there are 900,000 tons of industrial waste, and this is how it looked like before. And these various islands in Japan uh, are located in uh, the Seto Inland Sea, which is the first national park in Japan. That was one of the triggers for doing the development here. And what triggered this development was that my late father and the um, mayor of the village, Mr. Miyashima, uh, knew each other. And my father said he wanted to build a campground for the children, but he passed away, and so I took over. And um, the construction was um, really uh, something that took a long time, and this was, uh, you know, against modernization. And so we did not include candidates um, of architects from Tokyo. So we asked Mr. Ando, who is from Osaka, and um, had some other um, architects that participated here. And while I was working on this project, my thinking completely changed 180%. This is the campground. And the other thing that brought this about, this is um, Yasuo Kunihashi from April 3rd at the Smithsonian Museum. There is an exhibit until the end of August commemorating him, and I'm planning to participate there. My father started the collection of his artwork, and looking at that um, artwork and was really drawn to the message that was emanating from the um, artwork. So let me talk a little bit about um, we are in Naoshima. You saw some of the footage already. In, in 19, from 1987, I have been collecting the water lilies of Monet, and in 1999, at the Boston Museum, there was a commemorative exhibit of Monet's work, and when I visited that exhibit, the, I saw this big um, artwork, two meters times six meters in size. And when I went close up, the morning was really, I heard a voice from it saying, please, please put me next to you, close to you. And I said, oh, that must be impossible. But just in case, 
持ち主に当たったら I approached the owner. 買うことができました。And I was able to purchase it. まあ、そこがこの地中美術館の始まるきっかけで、まあ、これはですねこのコンセプトは21世紀のドグマのない宗教的なスピリチュアルな教会のような美術館を作るのを中心に置いて。And I wanted to put the water lilies in the center, and on both sides, I wanted to have two disciples on the side of Monet. So、um, I had the、uh, Walter de Moria and、uh, James Turrell、uh, works. And when I discussed this with Mr. Ando, he really was very enthusiastic about it. And you know, we are Venices, so we were thinking about what is good for the people, and we wanted to create that kind of、um, pilgrimage place for people to visit all over the world. And the Chichu Art Museum is the symbol of this promised land, it is like a church. And before that, I had、uh, Mr. Ando、uh, work on it, and so this is the Uh, uh, first hotel in the world where you can rest in peace,、uh, surrounded by artwork. And so I gradually enlarged the collection. And this is a work I particularly appreciate Bruce Nauman's 100 Live and Die. But also,、um, these islands. Um, the young people are leaving the islands and the old houses are deteriorating, and there's nobody to maintain these houses. And therefore, we decided that we want to preserve these old Japanese houses in the form of a gallery. So, we wanted a blending of modern art and old Japanese traditional houses. And so, the very first Project was、um, Tatsuo Miyajima's house in 1998. And 120 people from the island participated in、uh, creating it. And after that, this is the Kinza and then the Go O Shrine. There's an interesting episode about this shrine. The people on the island asked me they wanted to rebuild it, but they had a condition attached to it. If,、uh, if you know,、um, you are going to choose a modern art artist to do it, I can、um, you know, provide funds. And so, the Shinto、uh, shrine, which is a symbol of Japanese religion, this was the first time in history that a modern artist had worked on it. And this was actually.、Um, You know, it's deployed、uh, throughout the world. And so we have the Li Ufan Museum and the Ando Museum, both completed in 2013. Both have the representative works of both of them, especially Mr. Ando himself,、um, using his own foundation, donated money to build this museum. And this was also what was shown before. This is the Naoshiba Sento, which is the traditional bath. There is a first、um, uh, work of art in Naoshima where you can enjoy art naked. There are two of them. These are the first in the world. This is very stimulating. And this is the Inujima Refinery, Serensho Art Museum. This will be um, um, covered by Mr. Sambuichi later. But it was only used from 1906 to 1916, and over the next hundred years or so, it was deteriorating. But I purchased it and created this museum. There is no electrical ventilation, it's all just nature and air flowing through. And I think this will be explained later. But I wanted to create the utopia in Inujima, and I asked Ms. Seji. To work on it. This is the Teshima Art Museum by、uh, Mr. Nishizawa. 
Teshima is a rare island in Teshima where there is a water coming out as a spring, and so it's good for your body. And so we wanted to create the water and drops of water images, and I asked him to do that. And the other one was by Amariko Mori. This is um, Tadanori Yoko's a museum, a unique museum. But Teshima looks at life and death. That's the uh, theme of the museum. In the museum, water is created and life is born. And then with Volstansky, you hear the uh, living sound from the heart beating. And then you have the death at the end. So living well leads to dying well. That's my uh, thinking. Okay, so let's talk about the revitalization of Naoshima. It's a small island with a population of about 3,000, but more than 400,000 people from Japan and abroad visit each year. And um, during this um, Setoji Triennale, the figure exceeded uh, 700,000 people came from France, for example. So various people come to visit. And so we have guest houses, the public bath, and um, the people in the island give volunteer tours of the island. And so the island and the city and the women, when people look at them, they become much more beautiful. I think that's what's happening here. And so, um, in 私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私
We have the city, a large metropolitan city, and the rural areas in Japan. There are various different regions in uh, Japan which are unique, and uh, many of the elderly people are starting to um, disappear. So we need to think of this issue. So, you know, these abandoned uh, islands, we wanted to create something where people from the metropolis would come and envy the uh, islands. Everyone wants to be happy. I'm sure you all feel that way. So how can we create a community to make everybody happy? I thought about it a lot. And during this uh, process, I changed the name of my company to Benesse, and after the company name was changed to Benesse, I changed the business of our company drastically. And as I mentioned already, everybody wants to be happy, but how can we become truly happy? I thought about it. And so it's not just money and physical things. And so I think I thought about it and came to the conclusion that one needs to live in a happy community to attain true happiness. That was the first step. A happy community, we're not talking about life after death or heaven, but we are talking about a happy community that we can create right now. And I think that a community filled with the smiles of seniors, seniors are masters of life, so that's what I wanted to create. How is it possible to bring the island seniors to smile? Many people, do, elderly people do not smile, but as I said a little before, I wanted to bring modern art to the islands. I think this is the first time this was done in the world. And so it's become to be called the Naoshima method. Why did I combine seniors and modern art? Let me tell you a little secret. This is only for you, so please don't disclose this to anybody else outside of this room. But the modern art artists are all a very strange people. Architects create something proper, but artists don't create something that's understandable. They might go to some rural area and look, uh, collect the garbage, and then maybe a few weeks later they create a project. And then the elderly people, they, for example, they serve tea to the artists. And then they leave the projects behind and the artists go away. And then young people come to see the wonderful artwork. And then those pieces of art, when the young people look at them, suddenly there are the elderly people who come from behind and, and explain about the artist and the artwork because they helped create it. So the young people are surprised. They, they say they've never seen something like this before, so the elderly people really gain confidence. I don't know whether this is true or not, but everybody really, you know, feels that this is great and they believe them. And so the city becomes cleaner and organized, and um, there are art galleries now. So anyway, we have to um, continue and sustain our activities. The way to do it is um, the balance lies in the relationship between the foundation, Fukutake Foundation, the Vanessa Company, and the Fukutake family. Public interest capitalism versus financial capitalism. 
uh, Benesse Foundation has the Benesse companies a stock, and so they get the six point something percent of a dividend yield. And um, the Take family has money from the IPO, so we can provide the um, buildings and the artwork. And so that means that companies uh, produce a certain level of wealth. This kind of idea, maybe the financial capitalism, um, maybe this comes with the owner of a, an incorporated corporation. I think that one of the shareholders should be a foundation owning 5 to 10 percent of the shares. Because it's very difficult to go around asking for donations. Mr. Sakurai said so, I believe. It's difficult to do fundraising. But if you have the shares, of a large corporation, then that would be possible. It's not that difficult. If you get a shareholder's resolution and two-thirds of the shareholders agree, you can do that. So by making this kind of thing much more popular, these kind of cultural activities will help to create wealth. And the Corporations that create the wealth will work together with these foundations to uh, start these kind of projects. I really wish this would be done in Japan and the U.S. And so, I call this, um, you know, going from financial capitalism to public interest capitalism. And this is the final chart, but through these activities, I think that nature is man's best teacher. I really feel so from the bottom of my heart. Nowhere can we learn more than by looking at nature. And the second thing is what I always say, economy is a servant to culture. Economy should not take priority. Culture exists. Uh, economy exists for culture. Of course, not in you know, poor countries, maybe, but Countries with a certain level of prosperity and wealth, economy should not become the main purpose. I think in Japan, economy is still considered as the purpose. So the industrial developed countries should think of the economy as a means to create culture. That should be more strongly advocated. And so, as shown in the beginning title, creating something where there was nothing before. So, economic capitalism, I think, means you destroy something and then build something anew. But that kind of idea, I think, is a very dangerous idea. What something you build might be destroyed by the next generation. So in that sense, we want to um, make use of what already exists to create something new. That is the new value. And so through these activities, I would like to convey this message throughout the world. So these are the things I was thinking of um, in these island activities. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> 決して美しい島ではなかったと。現代
まあいわゆる世界で圧倒的にレベルの高い人たちが来てできればそこで自分の作品を作るとその場所にしかない建築その場所にしかない芸術そしてそこへ行か,行かないと体験できない場所を作ろうという話でしたからね。まあ、この直島全体があの良くなってくる中で手島犬島がまた新しい世界を作ろうとしてきましたそして建築家にも瀬島さん西澤さん三部一さんいろんな人たちが入ってきてですね良くなってきています。まあ、福武さんは初めから海がいいとそしてまあ自然はもう少し回復しなければならないけども美しい海があるというのがあの彼の考え方ですからできるだけ建築は見えないようにしようとで日本では珍しくあそこは国立公園なんですね国立公園の中の建築というのは非常に規制がありますが。できるだけ建築が見えないようにというところからベネスハウスからスタートしていますだからベネスハウスもほとんど埋まっていますで上にあるオーバルまで行くのにトロッコがありますがそのトロッコを見ながら海を見るとそして森を見るとそして上にオーバルのところに水面がありますが水面はいわゆるまあ海の上に乗ってるんだということをを象徴ししてて海にし水に水ようと考えてまして地中美術館は完全に埋まっていますこれはなぜ埋まっているかというのが、まあ、静かに現実を見るで自然とともに生きているということを感じる海を見るそしてもう一回回復させた森を見るということになってましてほとんどの建築が、まあ、見えないようにと。100年前の壁と屋根との中に現在の壁とコンクリートの壁を入れることによって間にいわゆる風の道ができますそのだけでいわゆるカーボンゼロ冷暖房のない建物を作ろうと斜めの壁がありますがこの壁の反射で光を受けるというので日没閉館になってますでそのエネルギーゼロでありながらまあ海へ日は入場料だけでやろうというコンセプトは非常に良かったのは福武さんはいつも厳しい条件を出してきますだからその厳しい条件を答えるためには新しい想像力がいりますからそういう面ではあのアンドミュージアムも100年前の民家と現在の技術とで我々が考えてきた直島のいわゆるプロセスを展示することによって。僕の人たちがやってみますけど暗いとかね寒いとかね暑いとかあんまり言わないんですよねそれはやっぱり体験する中で自分が感じ取っていくんだろうなということを考えてましてこれも含めて直島の最初から古いものを残そうと新しいものを入れようと未来を考えようとそして美しい海と美しい緑とそして来た人が楽しく。元気よく帰っていく姿を見ると、これは福高さんの初めからの考えで、元気よく体験した人が帰っていく楽しそうにということがあの我々行ってみて時々伝わってきて良かったなと思ってますよ。あの最初にえー、っと。I'll start by explaining about the Teshima Museum. The building is located on the island Teshima. It's on, up on top of a hill that projects out toward the sea. Teshima. Is if you、um, write it in Japanese, means wealthy island. And certainly it has a wealth of greenery and water. And also, being next to the sea, then water, of course, would be one of the themes of this building. And then you see the building. Here, the, at the location of where this building now is, there was originally a spring. And there is some significance in locating the building there as well. 
Mr. Kutake made a number of requests. Uh, many of them were made a deep impression on me. One was to use Ray Naito's art and to use one of her pieces of art as a permanent fixture. So that means that Ms. Naito would have just that one piece of art that would be located within the architecture and never be changed out. Um, another one of the requests is that Ms. Naito's art work be harmonized with the architecture. Uh, when you have a permanent installation uh, like that, then you have the architecture, you have the environment, and uh, they will be there forever together. And so finding a harmonization between those elements becomes a significant challenge. So how do you go about doing that? How do you go about making the, the, uh, the artwork continuous with the surrounding environment? Here's a diagram from the initial design phase. As an idea for the uh, architecture, we wanted to emphasize free-form curves and have one room as a building that would be shaped like a space that's like a water droplet. You put an architecture of straight lines and within nature, nature curves naturally, and so you have to f form the nature to the aperture. But instead, we have the architecture that is that is forming freely and adapting to uh, the shape of the earth around it. And that's where you're building the building. And by doing so, you you can more easily communicate the harmonization and more easily express the harmonization between architecture and, and nature, the nature surrounding it. But it's, it has to fit the, the topology and, and the area around it. It has to fit the, the, the hill that is around it. And it's just the, the one room that the structure is made from. So this free-form free curve is not just in the planar direction, but also in the cross-sectional direction as well. And Ms. Naito's uh, work of art is like a water spring where the spring, uh, where water springs from the bottom. And I think it's because it's related to the fact that this is a location where there originally was a spring of water coming out of the land. And so this, in her work of art, there is water that springs from the ground and, and eventually grows. And there's so there's more and more within the building. And so you can see uh, that there's part of this form is is looking what we're trying to do. It's like a shell structure. It's like a seashell uh, shape that we're looking to form here. And that's the that's the the roof that goes above that. The roof that goes over Ms. Naisto's work of art. This is a computer graphics uh, design that we uh, developed, sort of a, a projection uh, image that we created. So how do we create this curved uh, uh, roof? It's, it's an architectural issue. What we did is when we built the foundation, we kept the land. We used that earth to create mounds. And then we placed molding and and. and and uh, a form over it and then put the concrete on top of that. And so the concrete is not flat, it's curved concrete. And so we use the earth um, to create that, that mold for us. And that, in that sense, it's very rational. Um, we put steel... Uh, reinforcement over it and then pour it in the concrete. And overall, it's a shell structure. It's almost like a dome structure in its shape. But if you were to to split it in half, it would it would fall in on itself. And therefore, the the concrete needs to be like one uniform structure. And so this concrete work. We could not break it into to two parts. We had to do it all continuously. And so the, the construction word actually took all day. This picture is taken in the middle of the night. And the concrete workers worked all the way into the morning uh, to do it in a continuous manner. So when you have a free-form free curve, you have that, 
that occur of working with nature. And so then, once you have that, you don't know which came first, the, the nature or the substance. It's not as if nature is subservient to the its architecture. Architecture is not subservient to the nature either. And you don't know where that relationship is. And, and that's where you end up with the har- harmony, I believe. So through this architecture, we have a, a couple of um, openings in, in the hole, and then the, the builders took the land out from underneath, and that's what built the space underneath the roof of the structure. When we removed the soil from underneath it, you have these, these holes that remained in the, in the roof. We decided not to enclose the roof with glass. Instead, we left them open. And it's under one of these holes that we have Ms. Naito's work of art with, with this water spring from underneath. And of course, when it rains, then the rain falls through the hole inside the building and, and merges um, uh, together with Ms. Naito's work. And so in that sense, even more so, architecture, nature, and, and, and art uh, become in, uh, integrated into one. And so this, this large hole in the roof, we used it during construction, but we left it there in, in, its com- in the building's completed form. You can see how the building lies on the landscape. It's a different color, but it has a mysterious softness to it, and that softness uh, allows the architecture to blend with the nature, I believe. If you look just above it, there's the, that's where the ticket center is. You buy the ticket, yeah, your tickets at the ticket center, and you do not approach directly to Ms. Naito's work. Instead, you have the, um, the terrace patties uh, to the right of it, and the, the rice... The Paddy Terrace also is something worked uh, together with uh, Fukutake-san's work where they rebuilt some rice paddy terraces um, that are now very wonderful, uh, wonder- wonderfully rebuilt um, rice paddy terraces. And so you walk through the rice, uh, near the rice paddy terrace and through the woods and approach the, the Rie Naito's work. The entrance is very narrow. Uh, essentially so only one person can come in and out through that space. And Ms. Naito's, her work is is the, the spring the water coming up through the earth. It's not something that you enjoy while talking with others. Instead, we we imagined having people coming one at a time um, through the entrance. And so there was we're probably influenced by other works of art where you have one person come in and enjoy it. And, and, and of course, we have water coming in, but also animals could also potentially come in through the building. And that's an, another way that, that you have nature, landscape, architecture and art integrated into one whole and, and create its own singular world. Uh, at least that was our effort to do so. Thank you for your attention. Good evening, I am Sejima. Thank you all for coming to our event today. I worked on the Inushima House Project, and so I'm going to explain about that. Mr. Fukutake already explained earlier the Seto Inland Sea. There are many islands in the sea. One of them is Naoshima, and then there is also the Teshima Island, and uh, it's a triangular uh, location, uh, 30 minutes away from these two, is where Inushima lies. I think this is a unique island. To exaggerate a little, this tiny island is maybe not actually an island, but an architectural building that grew a little larger, so when you um, walk around, it's difficult to find where you are walking in a city, but in Inushima, you always know where you are in relation to the geography of the island, so you're all happy. You know where your own house is, probably, but to exaggerate, that is what I feel 
for this whole island of Inishima. So when we look at the island from above, so Mr. Sambuichi is going to follow me and give a presentation, and he built a museum. This, is the ten, this was the um, uh, re, proper refinery that was mentioned, only operated for about 10 years. And in the middle here is the village where my project is. So there are many ponds in Inushima. It's famous for its rocks. So there are a lot of uh, rock quarries, and then and after all the uh, stones are taken out, a, a pond is created. And on the other side, there are still operational quarries. If you walk pretty slowly, you can co um, cover the whole island in about two hours. And the village in the middle, I wanted to try something there. Mr. Fukutaki invited me. I think it was about seven years ago. As Mr. Kutake already explained, in Naoshima, he worked on uh, various projects with Mr. Ando and was successful, so he wanted to expand that throughout the Seto Inland Sea. So he asked me to cooperate with him. And the first thing he told me was, we want to revitalize the island through art. Inoshima, at one point, had about 3,000 uh, inhabitants when the refinery was in operation, but now there are only about 45 people, and the average people, age of the people are about 80. So we wanted to revitalize them through art, and we decided to build a gallery. So we walked around the village and asked who was willing to rent us the space. And during um, this past seven years, we built about five galleries. What kind of galleries? This is what the first one. This was the location closest to the wharf, and there's a small shrine. It's right below that. And further into the village, there are two more. This is the first phase and second phase of the construction. And this, uh, you know, a wooden house uh, was um, completed last year. And then coming back more from the village towards the ocean, there's another one. So, what I thought most interesting about the Inishima project, and I learned this over the past seven years, is that nothing was decided initially. First, you know, we went to uh, people who we thought might be able to rent us the space, and some people said no, and some people we weren't expecting offered us space, and so we built the gallery there. And so, it wasn't already decided from the beginning. But it evolved. We did something, it was successful, and then we decided to add something. And so there wasn't one you know, goal, but it was just a continuous process of working on these projects, and that's still continuing today, and that's what I find most interesting. And also, I talked about size earlier, but initially, I thought it was just going to be a recollection and, you know, kind of um, memorial, but that was important for each. But I wanted the whole village to become an art museum, and I started to feel that way. And also, I'm going to show some chronological uh, photographs from now on, but normally when you think of architecture, first there's a client and they said they want this or they have these problems, could you work on this, could you um, do this? And then we get the order and so we architects think about it and design it and then somebody does the actual construction and then the clients use it. So it's all separated, but in this project on this island, there was no formal purchase order and um, people who were thinking about it, who were building it, and then who would use it, were all immersed into one. And even if it's created, it's not complete, and you start thinking, well, we can add on to that, and we should do this next. 
So new ideas come out. And Mr. Fukutake talked about, um, you know, going uh, from the modern world to uh, further modern world. So we don't have a clear purpose and clear demarcation of roles. It's nothing is really decided. So everybody just continues to work on it and use it. And, you know, we, we feel it. And that's all possible because of the small size. So this is the initial survey research. So we wanted to preserve this as much as possible. But this one, the roof was leaking, so we had to, you know, build um, a new uh, roof using um, new materials. If we can use something, then we just replace those parts which are unusable, and so whatever roof uh, we can preserve, we would use it. This is the first one that was built. This was an ordinary house. But since it was to be a gallery, we removed the walls inside. はい、あの、全体の difficult, but they started to think about creating something unique for Inishima, and so most of the galleries are transparent, and so there are no walls. So people who come, look at the artwork, look at nature surrounding it, and look at the lives of people here. So that was gradually what was built up. This was the... Uh, あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あ
actually, we showed this video, but this is two weeks ago, the new exhibit that just opened. And so we started the Triennale. So the original idea was to chase the exhibits every three years, but when we started doing it, with a population of only about 50, if all five a gallery start to chase the exhibit, then suddenly 50 people would come and have a big party for changing the exhibits in all five um, galleries at once. So we shouldn't do that. Let's do it one by one. Each year we would choose one gallery that would change the exhibit, and then 10 people would come for that and have various small parties each year. And so partway through the project, we changed the direction. So this is the hammock. And this time, it's all open and being used. So these five galleries, they all change one by one a little bit. And so these are the side galleries. This is the flower garden. Local people take care of the garden, and once a year, a professional gardener, an artist, comes to change the direction. So that means that in this whole village, the museum was created, and through the process, what part of it constitutes the exhibit, that's an issue, but people are part of it. And as we did that, there are possibilities that we could increase galleries in the future, but maybe we should go in a different direction. That's what we started to think. So this is the size, for example. This is the Metropolitan Museum. So this village is maybe smaller than the Metropolitan Museum. So when we think of Inujima as a whole, as I as was explained previously, the Benesse House, and there's a hotel in this area. It's in the same area. So the whole island is one area. So whether it be a theater, hotel, school, museum, we, it's growing. That's what we are thinking of. And it so happened that this was where the refinery was, and there's a beautiful beach here, and there's a quarry here, and then there are some places where they used to um, dig for the rocks, and there were various performances. This is a poster from two years ago, but uh, people from a theater, a troupe, came and spent about three months on this um, island and did an outdoor theater. So we want to do more of that on Inushima, and these projects are starting right now. And so, people need places to practice. And also, the village says um, to renovate um, the houses would cost a lot of money, but they all have small sheds, and so they would uh, renovate the sheds to make it into guest houses or to make it into a school. Everybody can share the toilet and the bath and the dining and kitchen. And then, and everybody, when they go to sleep, they would go to the small sheds. And if there's a large group, there was one time a school on this island when there were more children. So there are gymnasiums and um, classroom buildings, and so people can stay there if it's a large group. So it could be a school or a theater. And so the population is declining. As I said, the average age is about 80 on this island. So the population is decreasing. But many people want, uh, can feel this is their own island, and they have different ways to use the island. So what should we call this, an island or some architectural structure? But everybody is thinking about that, and everybody continues to use it. So that's the kind of place we are creating here in Inushima. And also, in the future, uh, Mr. Nishizawa will um, 
I consider architecture to be part of the earth and when considering architecture I think that you need to consider the earth and in that case the most important thing is moving material moving material is, is wind and it is water water becomes vapor when sun contacts it once it becomes vapor it becomes lighter and therefore floats up as that vapor floats up Uh, because it, it gets cooler and cooler, it changes to water again and then falls to earth again. Once that water falls to earth again, that is where it comes into action, interaction with the landscape. If the water flow is fast, it makes it difficult for organisms to live there. But if the topography allows for a slower water flow and that moving material slows down, That creates an environment for uh, life and those moving material to interact. And so it's the velocity of the moving material and life matters. Uh, that relationship is what is important. Plant life also changes depending on moving material. For months, if there is no water, then the plant life uh, accumulates it. Depending on local situations, because of the changes in moving material, you also end up with different forms of plant life. Even in the same location, the same mountain, the south slope and the north face, you have different moving materials working on each side. And therefore, the plant life and the shape of that plant life also changes. I think that the earth has a variety of different topographies, and we live within those different topographies. The velocity of moving material uh, changes depending on the topography, and the relationship between human life and plant life and moving material and architecture, uh, these design acts of design. What one of the most representative examples would be Japan's terraced rice paddies. This is a paddy terrace from nearly 500 years ago in the Monomata region. There used to be a river that flowed here. I don't know if it was intentionally destroyed or destroyed through a natural disaster. The uh, paddy terrace was destroyed and then recreated by people following that. How did they go about recreating that that? Paddy Terrace. You can, because of the river, the, the velocity of the water flow, you cannot create a, a plant. You cannot plant rice. But with the, as people uh, build and take rocks and put it there, they slow down the velocity of the water. By controlling the moving material, uh, they create an environment where they can grow rice. And other small plant life, other living or organisms are born there as well. And the rice that is cultivated there uh, can be provided to humans by food, as food. We consider the control of these moving materials as something that we uh, have done in Japan and created new cycles of life in this case. When you look at this, lands, this, this energy scape from 500 years ago um, and think it's beautiful, then 
what is it can, will we create today that would be considered beautiful 500 years from now? And I think that it's where art, architecture, water, air, by controlling these moving material and allowing and uh, creating an environment um, where a cycle of life can be created with human life and plant life. Yeah, the architecture can play a role there, and if, and if it can successfully play that role, it could be considered to be beautiful um, 500 years from now, as that energy scape I just showed you was. And that is the thought process that led me to, uh, to the idea for the small museum in Inujima. Uh, Inujima, about 300 years ago, was a rock quarry, as Ms. Sejima explained to you earlier. Uh, but uh, we're told that the original size of the island was about three times what it is now. Once they were done with the rock quarrying, they built a copper, copper smelter there. But the pollution from the copper smelter uh, destroyed the plant life that was there. Uh, but as I explained earlier, you had uh, something in nature that was once broken, um, but you can recreate it, control the, the moving material, uh, the water and the wind there, and create a new uh, cycle of energy um, to recreate life uh, in this island. And that is the thought process that led me to uh, my research in Inujima. I looked at photographs from 100 years ago, and if you, I noticed moving material in the photographs. You see the smoke coming out of the smokestacks. You can see that the smoke is flowing from east to west. Looking at other photographs, in each of these photographs, I confirm that the wind was moving from the east to the west. This wind from the east, this moving material that is flowing from the east, I thought it was one of the moving material uh, of Inujima. And looking at the chimneys that remained on the island today, you could see that the air inlet on the chimneys uh, were all facing east. Uh, based on that, I, I took the belief that much of the wind in Inujima was coming from the east. I wanted to try and control that wind and utilize it in the museum I would create. Also, in my research of Inujima, I saw this black substance that I had never seen before that had been discarded there. In the process of smelting the copper, this is a byproduct. It's a slug that's generated as part of that process. And with my research, what I learned is that when subject to sunlight, this material was very good at gathering heat. So I decided I would take the energy from the sun and use this material to control the air, the air and the wind. There were a number of chimneys in, the, in, in Inujima. I decided to put a glass skirt around one of the, chime, uh, one of the chimneys and then place the bricks of that slug, uh, lay those out on the floor. When the sun hits it and that warms the air, that would make the air lighter, and then that would flow out the top of the chimney. By using these moving materials, I could create a mechanism of ventilating the the museum, and so the, you have air flowing through the museum as a result. Uh, it was completed in 2008. You can see there's the glass hood at the bottom of the chimney. This is where we collect the, the sun's energy and make the air light. The air that becomes light comes from the cooler space that is underground. So in the summertime, you have the summer coming through the underground space. In the winter, the sun warms the air. And you have... You have the air coming through the space where the, the air is warmed by the sun, which also eventually heads out the chimney. These moving material, people enter the museum together with the air that comes into it. And so the entrance to the museum also faces east. Air and people enter the museum together. 
And the air leads you through the museum. This air, this moving material, by we have windows that allow us to adjust the velocity of the air. By closing the window and making the window opening smaller or larger, we can change the velocity of the air. You can see that there are people here. They are walking along with the flow of the air toward the light, approaching the museum. The air is moving together with the people. This, is approach, this approach goes underground, and so when the air uh, uh, becomes and comes in contact with the wall, then the net is pulled away with it, from it. The, the wall is formed in a wave form from steel. We created wave in order to increase the surface area that comes in contact with the air. Another thing we did is we used the pressure of, of the earth underground. And this air uses the forces of nature, the, the sun, to move. There is not, there's not a fan used in here. There's no fan, no electricity used here. The forces of nature alone move the air through the approach. When, by the time you get into the, to the main hall, it's already much cooler. In the main hall, you have a glass hole. Here, uh, we're warming up the air and making the air lighter. The air be that it became lighter gets, moves up through the chimney and re returns to the earth. We're, we're not using any energy to apply any force to it. It's through the forces of energy and therefore a continuous process. As long as the sun remains and the sun shines, then uh, the energy will remain. The path uh, and the approach, we also wanted to use nature for it. We put mirrors in the corners to reflect light in there. And so as you walk toward the light, you walk along with the flow of the air and to enter the museum. Mr. Yanagi provided um, artwork in the, in the hall to show the movement of the air. In the main hall, there is stone from Inujima. And this is what adjusts the temperature through between winter and summer. You have this culture um, uh, from centuries ago when rocks were quarried there, and we wanted to communicate that, that culture as well. Finally, you have the copper smelting that we wanted to communicate that history of the copper smelting. We, t we took bricks that were from the slug discarded there and made that a, a floor out of it. Uh, we collected about 17,000 from the sea. That cleaned the sea as well, and we use these bricks um, to attract heat from the sun, which warms the air, and the air flows out of the chimney, pulling new air in. What's important here is where people fit in. Human life and plant life uh, create a cycle of what they don't need. Humans do not need carbon dioxide, which plants do. Plants do not need ox oxygen, which we do. And so, plants probably think that we breathe in such horribly dirty air. But that's a difference of perspective, and depending on that difference of perspective, what we discard uh, differs. Um, and with that, then we have the earth. But as the earth as a whole has nothing to discard, and so when I looked at this, I wanted to create a similar cycle within our, our museum. We're taking excrement, we use that to fertilize greenery, and that greenery would create fruit. And that f fruit and greenery would create shade. With that, you have other moving materials. Uh, people, you have wind. When people uh, come to the museum, uh, they have uh, excrement, which is recycled back into the environment. And as that process continues, the island becomes greener and greener. 
Um, and the more greenery you have on the islands, the more shade you have. And the more shade you have, the cooler the earth underneath that shade becomes, which benefits the process of our museum, which uses no electrical power whatsoever to circulate air through it. This is uh, use what you have to create what is to be. And I think that that's a wonderful message. Uh, and we have air, wind, waste, items that are discarded, excrement from the human visitors. The more human visitors come, the better the place uh, becomes. Instead of having more visitors meeting more garbage to take care of, instead, the more visitors you get, the better the place comes. And that's by using what we have. As a result, we use no sour solar panels, no wind, wind, windmills. We use the uh, energy of nature itself. There's another, something else, the Naoshima plan that I'm working together with Mr. Fukutake on as a way of um, revisiting the town of Naoshima, creating a hall and a private guest house for Mr. Fukutake, a small residence there. The hall will be in the middle of Homura in Naoshima, and uh, there is an old home that we will renovate, and that will be near the port in Homura. I did about two and a half years of research on Naoshima, uh, the sea, the land, and a variety of places I, I did my research. I looked at the old maps from hundreds of years ago. One of the things that I discovered new about Naoshima is that Naoshima is, is now known for its contemporary art known for its contemporary architecture, but actually, for many, from many centuries ago, it is a town that used moving materials. This, one of the things that I learned in my research is that on the south and the north of homes, you had a garden. And you had, both on the north and south sides, uh, decks, and then you had Japanese-style rooms that, that connected and opened up to each other, um, north, neighboring each other on the north side as well. This is where they utilize moving material in Aoshima. Here, drinking tea, a nice wind blows through. You have your, your balcony, and then you have your garden on the other side. And the wind comes in from the south and through the north. So I looked at some of the other older houses as well, and I found that they were all the same. You had two rooms connected to each other, north-south, and a balcony on both the north and south sides, and the garden on the north-south side. All of the homes um, had uh, continu that continuation north, uh, from south to north, um, the wind blowing from south to north. And I could see that from for centuries ago in Naoshima, you had that moving material that was influenced the build of, of homes in Naoshima. I think that this is something that people from 300 years ago, this is the message that the people of Naoshima were communicating to us. From the research, I, the two and a half years of research that I did on Naoshima, everything that I found is that the old homes were well aligned with the direction of the wind. And so I wanted to communicate this message to uh, future generations hundreds of years from now. And so I thought of architecture that would take advantage of this moving from material. I thought uh, I would try and form architecture that would take advantage of Naoshima's wind. I used a, a semi-gabled roof structure. In, in, in Inuyajima, I used uh, gravity. I used um, the energy of the sun to warm it. But in this case, in Naoshima, I'm looking to use pressure differentials in the wind. As the wind goes through the, the roof, then you end up with a pressure differential and you, get, you create a, a, a very slow wind flow. You can see the wind, the air moving slowly. And you, if you create space underneath, then it creates it warmer in, in, the, in the winter and cooler in the summer um, as the wind is pulled through. And if, if that is, is a location for the people of Naoshima to enjoy their traditional culture and activities and sports, and that is the location which fits Naoshima, 
It is organic to Naoshima. Um, it's still under construction, and we plan to complete in fall this year. There, you can see the holes in the roof that allow for the wind flow. And this small village, just as it was centuries ago, you have the connection between south and north. And we're creating an extension on this private house. We're also raising the floors so that the wind uh, can, can flow underneath the floors. And in order to prepare for occasional water damage as well, we have the higher floors as well. And so the village in Naoshima is called Homura. This village called Homura used to have just rice paddy terraces. Those paddy terraces had water flowing through them, and there were ponds that controlled the flow of the water. And it's at the end of that moving material where you had the village of Homura. There were water channels in the village of Homura as well. In the summer, you have the water would be collected in the rice paddies, uh, terraces, and the wind would flow over the rice paddies and cool off and enter the, the village down below. Now there are a variety of different residences and architecture working on with a great deal of variety in, in, in Naoshima and Homura. Uh, we're rebuilding the rice paddy terraces and as water fills these rice paddy terraces, it will cool off the air that blows down on Homura. In the same Seto Inland Sea on the island of Miyajima, you have an island of Miyajima, and Miyajima is an example of architecture using moving materials well. It's one of, it's the most beautiful piece of architecture, I believe, in the world at Miyajima. Miyajima is similar to Naoshima. You have a moving, the moving material that's used, and, and this architecture is built right by the sea. What's What's interesting here is you have the moon that is the moving material, which changes the height of the sea. At low tide, the building appears to be on land. At high tide, the building appears to be floating on water. It's the moving material that, that adds to the beauty of this, uh, of this architecture, and that changes every six hours. So architecture that shows the moving material I believe that a thousand years from now will still be treasured by people, will still be the pride of that village, and that's the type of architecture I would like to make. And so on the mountain peak where you can see Itsukashima, uh, Itsuka Jinja down below, Itsukashima Jinja down below, uh, we're creating a, a, an architecture for moving material there. You have large items and small items. Just like in the forest, you have tall trees and, and shrubs. And I believe these individual architectures will become a, 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 a forest um, that interacts with moving material and interacts with human life and, and plant life. And I believe that's what is beautiful about the architecture. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you all very much. Um, this was incredibly stimulating. Um, I... Uh, I was in, in Naoshima and on the islands uh, in 2010, uh, right at the end of the first uh, Triennale, and there seems to be so much new uh, architecture and new ideas uh, that are taking shape um, on the islands, and it's, uh, it's really fascinating. I want to uh, bring us to talk about that. Um, I wanted to actually just sort of start off with uh, an observation of my own, actually, uh, that I think um, really came across through the images that, that we saw and through uh, the comments that were made about the moving materials and the sense that one has in Naoshima and on the islands in general of being uh, in the middle of... Uh, a, a natural environment in which one, uh, there, there are kind of flows and a rhythm in which one suddenly uh, sort of takes on those rhythms and those, 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 that pace, uh, and that there is this sense of, a, of kind of moving materials where we don't normally think, I think, 
of moving materials. We think of uh, energy being separate from matter, but actually this is about matter and energy uh, sort of in a, in a loop, in a flow, creating each other. So I, I visited the islands, um, as I said, in uh, 2010, and to experience them is when I was going to, um, uh, I was planning to write about the architecture, and I wanted to experience the buildings firsthand uh, in their natural setting, and the settings that they were designed for, but it also what was really interesting to, was to see them in, uh, with the artworks that are in and around them, because again, it's like the moving materials, everything is in contact with everything else, everything is about relationships, uh, and so in a way, and I encourage you all um, to make the trip, uh, that's the way to really understand um, the architecture on the islands and, and how the architecture interacts with the landscape, the sea, the artwork, and the villages. And it's interesting, actually, as one travels there, um, it's a bit of a space uh, and time travel, actually. Uh, there's a sense of, of time uh, slowing down as space gets bigger. And as you approach the islands, actually, uh, you approach by boat, and this gives a wonderful introduction to the site and the experience. And the, Sita, the Seto Island, uh, Seto Inland Sea, actually, sets up these dualities that Mr. Fukutaki was talking about um, that you encounter throughout, throughout your visit to the islands. Um, it's this, the, 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 the kind of, uh, the contradictions, the opposites that are constantly floating around each other. For instance, the sea around the islands themselves uh, is very calm. It's actually uh, perfectly calm and very peaceful, but then in the distance, you see um, huge tankers that are passing through the inland sea. So you realize that this is actually a major shipping uh, route, and so it's one of those contradictions. You feel like you're in a very remote place where time uh, is standing still. If not standing still, it's just moving at a different pace. And then you realize, actually, you're right in the middle of things as well. And so there's this, this sense of timelessness uh, that is mixed with absolute contemporaneity. And I think that that's the magic of it. Um, and I think that also perfectly encapsulates um, uh, the spirit of the project and of Mr. Fukutaki's vision, um, which he describes, I think, very evocatively in terms of symbiosis. And I think um, that's the idea I'd sort of like to start with now, is this concept uh, of symbiosis. Um, it's interesting, you know, in, in the dictionary, um, symbiosis is a kind of interaction between different organisms that live in close physical space and close physical association with each other. Um, and that association is to the advantage of all of those organisms. And so it's mutually beneficial, but it's also transformative. And uh, that idea um, of symbiosis, in a way, is about bringing contemporary art, and I, again, I really think that the, the, the fact that it's contemporary, contemporary art, contemporary architecture, and contemporary nature, uh, it's nature that is, is, has been destroyed, it's nature that has, uh, that has a history, uh, and contemporary life. And it's, it's by bringing those things, and this is the idea that I understand from Mr. Fukutaki, in close physical association, something new uh, can emerge out of that symbiosis. And I guess that that's, um, at least in part, uh, how I understand Mr. Fukutaki's message, uh, which we've seen a couple of times on the screen this evening, and um, which various people have talked about, which is to use what exists to create uh, what is to be. And of course, that's incredibly interesting because you have to figure out what exists uh, so that you can use it and how you want to use it uh, to become something that you want to be. 
And so it's, it's an idea actually about the present, about what exists, and it's also a concept about the future, where to go. And I guess that that's where I would like to start uh, with Mr. Fukutaki, um, that what was it in particular about the existing conditions on the island of Naoshima and in the Inland Sea that drew you to that site, that what was it that existed there and existing in a, in a kind of living sense of existing that you felt was important to use to create your vision, this symbiosis of nature, art, and contemporary life? Hi. Yes. Well, I liked the Inland Sea, Seto Inland Sea, so I visited the um, area many times. But what motivated me the most was, as you uh, saw, the Seto Inland Sea was the first location in Japan to become a national park, even before Mount Fuji. And looking from afar, it's very beautiful. But when you could go closer, as I mentioned earlier, people had really destroyed the beauty. That was the main motivation for starting this project. If the um, you know, whole um, Inland Sea had been kept beautiful, this project probably wouldn't have been born. And so, as you said, creating something beautiful and then something ugly that people destroyed, these were all um, you know, dis, um, dispersed. But I wanted to bring them all together to create something. Because it, it seems to me that it's very important um, that uh, that there's a history on these islands, that there, there are traces of, um, uh, of human intervention, and that nature, it seems to me, is always conceived of as something that we participate in designing, that nature is something that human, that we have acted on forever uh, throughout human existence, and so the notion of bringing art and nature together is something that actually uh, is, is as old as those islands. And the, the idea that, that, uh, uh, that nature is never pure and that art is always um, social, it seems to me, and is always integrated uh, into uh, society. But I want to ask you one more question, which is about um, the first interventions on uh, the island, or the first architectural interventions, um, were museums. The museums by Catalando. Uh, the Vanessa House Museum in 1992, I think was the first one, and then the Chichu Museum in 2004. And um, you said something very interesting that I'd like you to elaborate on, if you would, uh, about the Chichu Museum in particular, you said that it was to be a different kind of museum for the 21st century. And it was to be, uh, you described it as an undogmatic spiritual place, an unreligious church with a strong centripetal force. I wonder if you could uh, talk about that a little bit. Well, our company was originally a publisher, so we had been publishing books, and then we worked on movies. And in general, art is something that shows the thinking and the feelings of the creator, the artist. It's an expression of what they want to express. And then many people try to understand what the artist is trying to express. 
However, when we look at modern art, depending on where it is placed, I felt that people view them very differently. To elaborate more on this, in the Seto Inland Sea, it's a very beautiful place. But there were a lot of、um, islands that were damaged. And so, in a sense, it's very spiritual. And how should I say it?、Um, why would these kind of artworks and these kind of spaces, why would They be created here. The people who come to visit the island, I wanted each of them to feel it in their own way and created a space like that. Nothing like this exists in Tokyo or in New York. So it's in the Seto Inland Sea, and in these islands, people used to live from a long time ago. But、uh, people. Were, uh, you know, the islands were damaged by people. So, as I said, I thought it wanted to be a symbolic space with architecture and artworks. And then people who come visit will feel something. And so I wanted to make sure that the people who came to visit the islands would form a view. So I said we didn't need any dogma. I understand. I, I understand.、Um, uh, and it seems to me that、um, those ideas about the museum and about the spiritual experience, that the architecture, it seems to me, and this is something that I, I wrote about, that the architecture seems to be the instrument through which、uh, it kind of sets in motion. It's that idea, again, I guess, of、uh, a moving material. That it sets in motion, motion this relationship and these sets of relationships. And I've、um, noticed that in the more recent buildings, there's a new concern, or at least a more direct concern, I would say,、um, with environmental issues. And、uh, that, in a way, it's interesting, there's a sort of another element that is coming into、uh, the islands, and that is almost a scientific. Approach、uh, to the environment, that you're bringing、uh, a certain kind of thinking、uh, into it. That the museum, and I'd, I'd like to、uh, sort of ask Mr.、Um, uh, Sambucci about this a little bit more that the museum is, is suddenly not about、uh, housing art only or about a place for. Looking at art, viewing art, but it's actually a place in which、uh, it's almost as if the senses are primary and that everything is art. That sludge, that byproduct of、uh, the copper mining. And so I wondered if you might say something a little bit, Mr. Sambucci, about.、Um, uh, This idea of the energy scape, which I think is, is really interesting, and also why you feel it's、um, your ideas about not converting energy, one form of energy, into another. I think that's an interesting idea. That,、uh, for instance, not taking wind or solar energy and turning them into electricity, but using them in their own and for their own material properties. And I, I find that a very interesting concept. And I thought maybe you could elaborate. So, this is a very interesting concept. Well, I think it, 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 it ties back into what Mr. Fukutake says about using、um, what is there, what exists, and to create、um, what is to be. ここにえー、福田さんがおっしゃられたような動くあ,のあるものを生かしないものを作るというような
and what existed there uh, using what exists to create what it was be. And uh, what I did is I used what it existed there and that's what I wanted to do to create what is to be and, and it was that philosophy that I used to create something in that museum that was unique to that island, something that could not be replicated somewhere else. And so instead of bringing something from, bringing materials from somewhere else um, or bringing in electricity, then that could be re replicated anywhere else. And, and uh, then that runs into sustainable issues and stuff and other things. And that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to use really just what existed there, use the power of what existed there to create something that could not be re replicated else, elsewhere, to so create something new. And, and that was sort of the message um, that, that I got from Mr. Fukutake, and that's what I wanted to do. It wasn't about creating a museum. It was about using the wind and people, we people, we are a material of the earth too, and we belong within the cycle. We participate in that cycle. And if that is the case, then I wanted to use the wind that was there, the air that was there. And I think that that wind, had, that air had the power of bringing people into that, into that, that circle, into that cycle. And, and that creates something new for the island and creates the ability to create new landscape for the islands. And I think it was those ideas by Mr. Fukutake that I wanted to adopt into the architecture. Um, and that's, that's what has been taken on by Ms. Sejima and Mr. Nishao as well. Um. I wonder if you think that that's an idea that uh, is transportable, that could go into, say, in a more urbanized environment, um, this notion of using what is there and not transforming energy types. Is that something that is very particular to this site, or do you think it's something that can happen more broadly? Uh, I think it is something that could be done anywhere in the world. I mean, there are many different differences that could be used in New York. I suppose a long time ago in Manhattan, you had many of those moving materials, that topography you had, and now it, it feels a very crowded, feels like a very crowded city. And but I understand that you had water damage in in Manhattan as well. Maybe that could be an opportunity to think about to revisit moving materials and apply those thoughts to or to urban areas as well. And I think that we're approaching a time where that can become a reality. Terrific. Thank you very much. And so I would like to turn to um, Ms. Sejima. Um, your work is also on the same island. Um, the smallest of the islands, uh, which is becoming incredibly dense, actually, with uh, artwork. And I think it's also very much involved with uh, remediation. Um, but the, the emphasis is a little more on, on culture and cultural remediation and social remediation. And I think that the interesting thing about the art houses in Inajima is that they're mixed in with the houses that people live in. And when you walk through the village, you, you sort of stumble across something. And you say, aha, uh, there's something else going on here. But then it also feels incredibly natural. And so that it's the, the art is literally mixing in with daily life and with this aging population, actually, who are, uh, uh, so there's this, this overlap. Um, and I wondered if you could describe a little bit, um, because I know that you've spent quite a bit of time on the island, of those relationships and those interactions and how they have worked in the village. Well, you mentioned becoming dense. But it's not as dense compared to Naoshima because it's all very small on Inajima. Um, the first project was what Mr. Sambuichi did, that is the museum. 
And the people on the island. だからなんとなくあのこういうところでこの説明をすると、本当にあの、あの、本当に、kind of あの、元気になるのかと、で人はどんどんここに移ってくるのかっていうのを質問を受けたりしたんですね。で、本当にそういうふうに言ってくるのかなっていうのを思ってたんだけども、だんだんまあ、やってくるんですけども、だんだんまあ、やってくるんですけども、だんだんまあ、やってくるんですけども、だんだんまあ、やってくるんですけども、だんだんまあ、やってくるんですけども、だんだんまあ、When we talked about the population, we talked of permanent residents in that location. But when we look at the elderly people living there, maybe on the weekend, they might go visit their children somewhere else. And maybe young people might come to the、um, island just to do a restaurant just over the weekend, or maybe 30. Actors and actresses might come to do some play for three months. And maybe I go there twice a month, for example. So there are many different ways to get involved. So continuing to be involved. And what I tried to say earlier was if there is a problem, then you try to resolve that and you create something else. And then you find somebody that can use it. That's not the way it works, as Mr. Fukutake. Even if Mr. Fukutake didn't ask for something, maybe we come up with our idea and then propose it. And then people would say, oh, that might be a good idea, that might not be a good idea. So, when you go see it, the people who go see it are part of the landscape. And when they visit a second time, it's a small island, so they feel like this is their own island that they came back to. And so, you can see how the island has changed. You can feel that. Well, how should I say it? It wasn't the clear demarcation of roles, and so it wasn't just one person, but people lived together. But when they gathered together, to a certain extent, you can、uh, work together、um, to do things, but gradually people started to divide the roles. But this is during the beginning stages where everybody was working together with nature and with other people. So, finding something there, how would people gather together? How would you touch what is there? Because if you don't think about it, everything will be destroyed. So, we really have to、um, you know, rethink that. And the shared kitchen that we are trying to create, of course, it's for the use of the visitors. But the elderly gentlemen who live on the island can use it. And I said this before, but let's say someone stays there, the construction worker stays there, then the elderly、uh, grandfathers bring something they cook. They said, okay, today I brought、uh, potatoes. Then, then they create various different dishes using potatoes. And so they bring it to the construction workers and, and also exchange it and share it with other people.、And、then you can get to enjoy different food items. And so we talked about moving materials, but many people, we should create a space where everybody can move freely. That's what I'm doing. And do the, the visitors, your idea of,、um, I thought that was a very interesting thing where people could come to the island. Because one of the things that happens when you're walking around the village is, is you feel that you really are、um, entering into、uh, at least the space of people's lives. And it makes you feel.、Uh, um, you know, you, you, you don't want to.、Um, You want to make sure that you're welcome. And I think that the idea of, of、uh, this house, I think, that you're, you're dealing with now, where people can stay over, is that right? Oh,、uh, yes. What we are doing right now is to go into people's lives, and at that time, we don't want to disturb them. And a friend of mine told me this. 
if you give them some assignment, then, you know, we would do, uh, visit the places in the morning and then in the afternoon we would work on a project building roads or working in the garden. So it's not only a place to stay, the accommodations, but if you assign some projects to the visitors, then maybe six months from now somebody might take over the building of the roads. And then the second time you visit, you might take off where somebody else left off. And so you don't want to, you know, be bother the people and this the people, but you want to get an opportunity to be more involved. So how should I say it? You feel you are part of building the island, and somebody else worked on it, but now you worked on another two meters of the road, for example. That kind of relationship should be created. So it becomes part of your own home. I think the interesting thing um, in all of this, too, is the, and I guess that that's a question for, for everyone, uh, is the role of art in this situation. Because I can understand the interaction, but is it the, how does the art work to uh, sort of, as a catalyst or in some way, uh, to get those materials moving? Would you like to? Art, many people come to visit the island. Everybody is looking for communication. And when they are looking for communication, they look for a common theme or topic. And so, as I said before, art can be interpreted in many ways because it's an expression a collection of expressions. And so many people come to visit and say, oh, well, I like this work of art, or I like this art, work of art, and they communicate with each other. And the best place for doing that communication is the public bath in Naoshima. By having the public bath, all the um, elderly gentlemen, and well, it's not, you know, a unisex bath. So in the men's bath, there are elderly, the, um, you know, grandfathers that talk about art with the visitors. Same goes for the women's bath. And so all of these um, elderly people and younger people enjoy conversing on a common topic. So it's a sort of media or a motif. Well, there really isn't anything clear, but modern art, I think, is open to a lot of, um, you know, different interpretations. If it's an established modern art, then art critics have it evaluated it it and criticized it and tell people how to look at it. But those kind of things, you know, then um, the you know intellectuals win. But with modern art, you can interpret art in any way you like, and I think that's what's very interesting. And so, because this is not a metropolitan area, it's a rural island, and so elderly people and younger people can communicate with each other. I think that's interesting, and you feel more human. That's my feeling. I think I, that's, that's a wonderfully put. Um, it, it, creates, it creates a t- it brings people together, literally, because it gives them something to talk about. And you talk about the um, uh, young people coming in from the city to uh, mixing with the older people who are on the islands and that there's this uh, conversation. So it's a, it's a kind of... All of these things, and I guess that this is part of the symbiosis, is that the boundaries between them are beginning to uh, become very soft. And, and that's a lovely thing. And I think that, actually, I wanted to um, ask Mr. Nishizawa about this, that it seems to me that the lines between art and architecture and nature almost disappear in the Teshima uh, Museum. 
and that there's uh, the, the, the museum itself, the, the artwork by uh, Ray Naito is uh, an integral part of the museum itself. In fact, it's an extraordinary experience, again, for those of you who have yet to go there. Um, you take your shoes off when you come to the museum and it's beautiful, smooth concrete and you walk on the concrete and suddenly you, your feet begin to feel wet. And you suddenly realize that there are actually little water bubbles coming up through the floor <clears throat> and they form these little rivulets. And so, and, and it just becomes totally fascinating and suddenly you start to see the tiniest details that capture your imagination. And I wanted to ask you about um, conceiving of that and how, how that came about. Well, Ms. Naito's work of art was very engaging, very attractive, really very pure. But working with her, what I really felt strongly is that there was a great deal of trial and error involved as well. And for the Teshima Museum, what Mr. Fukutake had requested is that you had art integrated with architecture. And that was a big way to begin, but even how you, you build it, you have the design of the architecture, you have the, uh, the study of Ms. Naito's art project, and they, the two were progressing at the same time. And I don't want to delve into too much of the process by which Ms. Naito came up with a work of art. I think that that, um, I, I don't want to show that disrespect to her. I think that there were changes that occurred to it. Um, and I think that there was a certain degree to extent where we were not aware of what we would end up with. Uh, and we were moving forward with the architecture at that time. And, and without sort of having that visibility as to what happened, when you look at what actually we end up with, we're very pleased with it. But at the end of the day, neither complied with the other. We just merged together. And that's what we ended up with. The water drops is something that I, I think that I thought I had came up with the idea at some point in the process, but once we were done, it felt like Ms. Naito's idea. So to be honest, I don't know where it came from originally. It's not as if it was all that and that happened, but I mentioned the earlier using the, the earth. It was Mr. Toyoda of Kajima, um, a general contractor in Japan, um, that had thought of that idea of using a mound of earth, earth uh, to create the construction because when you create the foundation, you end up with earth. Um, and because the shell was a very low profile anyway, you could use earth to, to create a mound of dirt and, and lay the concrete on top of that, that that would be a quicker way of doing it. When I heard him recommend that, I thought it was a very creative idea. Uh, because a mound of earth, you can create it in any form you like. You have a great deal of freedom and do so. And is that your construction method and that's what you're going to use to create architecture? Then, then that, the water droplets seem to work with it as well. And I think that there was an illusion that we began the conversation with construction method. But I think it was Mr. Toyota that, that probably led him to have that creativity in, in, in that process. And I think Ms. Naito also expressed creativity in, in, in her process as well. And I think that because it's a site of a spring in the first place, we ended up with a spring as part of the artwork. Um, and I think that, you know, I don't think I or Ms. Naito imagined that we would end up with, with what we did. And I think that perhaps what we ended up with was a presence that was even greater than, than I had imagined and perhaps Ms. Naito had imagined as well. 
And I don't think we imagined the the impact uh, it would have on architecture as well. Um, but in all, it was just a wonderful experience. Absolutely. Um, I have a question for you, Mr. Fukutake, which is um, you have assembled uh, an incredibly um, talented and thoughtful and inventive group of architects. Um, they're all Japanese. The artists who do artwork on the islands come from all over the world. Um, they're not necessarily Japanese. Uh, and I wonder um, if that, you know, if you could explain that, or is that something that you might broaden out or, or not? I don't know that many foreign architects, so that's the first thing. But several well-known architects I have seen, um, you know, their collection uh, through photographs, but uh, since I can't speak English, I, it's easier to communicate with Japanese architects. And the other thing is, as um, Mr. Nishizawa mentioned earlier, our recent projects are an integration of architecture and art. There are many such projects, and in that case, the architects, if they come from abroad and the artists are Japanese, I don't think a very good thing can be created. Because I think that nature and architecture and art must all be integrated. I think that is important. That's why it's how it is right now, and it will continue in this fashion in the future. However, as um, Mr. Nishizawa mentioned, listening to him, I suggested uh, combining in Mr. Nishizawa and Ms. Naito. I already decided I wanted a female artist to work together with Mr. Nishizawa because I thought that combination would be very good. And so initially I had considered some American artist as a candidate. However, thinking it through, I decided these two would be best paired together. I thought of it while I was in bed on the covers. So, it's really difficult to say actually when I decided on it, but it turned out that this combination was very good. But as I said many times, I was. Um, thinking many times through trial and error what kind of female artist would be best. So the combination is very important. And the Chichu Museum was the same thing. From the beginning when I had the idea, the Di Maria and Jin Taro, I met both of them, and I went to Rolling later, and I saw the lightning film. And after having done all that, I looked at, I talked about my concept to artists and architects, and that museum was created. And so, I wasn't thinking about architecture for a residence or as an office building, but something that would convey a message. And I wanted art, architecture, and art and nature all to be integrated, or else I didn't think the message would not strongly be conveyed. So, if, in order to create the strongest message, I want you to have the best combination. That's what I'm always thinking. I understand. Um, I think we'd like to open 
the, uh, the floor to questions, um, if you would like to ask questions of any of the speakers. I think we have time for a few, like two, three. Yes. I just have a question about um, how the future of the island will be considered when it becomes such a large tourist attraction. Because I think um, what makes it so interesting right now is that it has a lot of purity um, with its past. And I was wondering how they anticipate um, catering to the future with the amount of tourists that it will attract. Hi. I often get asked that question, but fortunately, it's an island. That means that the number of ferries coming to the island are limited, so we can't accommodate more people than can you know, be um, ferried on the boat. And so, as you said, the more people come, some, we don't think the better because when you come to the island, um, our staff and also people living on the island or people who run restaurants and inns on the island, they will have to take care of the tourists that come to the island. So, we don't want to place too much of a burden on these people. So, we want to adjust the number of visitors. That's possible because it's an island. That's one good thing about being in, on an island. And the other thing is, in our museum, we limit the number of people who can come in, so we issue a tickets. And then you can, uh, only a certain number of people can come inside at a particular time frame, and we control it. Okay. Maybe one more question? Hmm? Uh, this is for, um, really for anyone. Um, can, on these islands where you have an aging population, and you have restaurants and other people now coming to deliver services, do you see a younger permanent population developing uh, that will continue the traditions of the island? Yes, uh, gradually younger people are coming, however, more than that, the elderly people uh, are becoming more active. I think that's what's most important. Let me tell you a story. This is an actual example in on Naoshima, this was about 10 years ago, there was this elderly gentleman, 74 years old, his wife had passed away from cancer about 10 years before that, and one time he said to me, I want to get married again. That's what he told me. And so I said, well, what kind of person would you like to marry? And he said, um, you know, well, he said this was this woman that had visited Naoshima many times and was in love with the island. And so I said, well, how old is she? How old do you think she was? I was surprised. She was 26. This 26-year-old uh, woman really loved the island, and then 
fell in love with this elderly gentleman. Well, they're not married yet, but they are together often, even now. So, aging doesn't mean that you lose energy or you can't be active. But rather, in, you don't no, you can't find the means to become more active. So I think with that example in Naoshima, everybody heard that story on Naoshima. And every time a ferry came to the island, the elderly gentleman you know, lined up on the wharf to try to get young ladies, and they would guide them around the island. This is a true story. So if you're looking for that kind of experience, please do come to Naoshima. We'll be waiting for you. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. I think that um, there's going to be a reception afterwards so that you can, uh, if you have other questions and would like to talk to any of the speakers, uh, you will have the opportunity to do that. Um, I'm going to just sum up in two minutes um, uh, this, this event. And I think that one of the, the really important things about Naoshima and the whole art project, uh, and that makes it actually unique, is among art sites <clears throat> and uh, land art projects and so on, I think the closest one to it is Fogo Island, which you may have heard about in, uh, in Newfoundland, uh, where there are studios and so on, but it doesn't seem to have that same kind of, and I think it's what I would call a, a social imagination uh, that goes with it, that uh, it's a social imagination that is about the environment, it's, it's uh, the focus of the environment itself is uh, natural, it's physical, but it's also social and it's cultural. And I actually, one of the most, um, I'm going to tell a story too, but a very short one. Um, one of the most memorable experiences I had uh, on the island in Naoshima um, was the last evening that, uh, that we were there uh, on the island. And it was Mr. Fukutake gave a party. For, to celebrate the end of the 2010 uh, Triennale. And so villagers from all of the islands came uh, together and we gathered in a community center. We all sat on the floor and there were shoes outside, just rows and rows of shoes. And people got up and they talked about uh, what they did during the weeks of the exhibition, how they participated, what their contributions were, uh, what their experiences were. There was a slideshow of various events uh, and places. Uh, there was a lot of food, and I seem to remember there was also a lot of beer, actually. So there was a lot of singing uh, and storytelling. And, and the, what I was really struck by, actually, was the, uh, the tremendous warmth and the good feeling and the sense of pride, actually, uh, and achievement. Um, that, and it was the sense that everyone had been involved in something special and that uh, they had been changed by that experience. And that not only are the islands changing, but the people who are, as, as Mr. Fukutaki just said, uh, are changing themselves because of what is happening there. And I think that um, one final thought here, uh, Mr. Fukutaki has talked about the Naoshima method uh, and the Naoshima method, which involves, um, uh, in his words, using the power of contemporary art to energize communities, uh, a way of investing in the public good. And I would just like to add to that, that I think it also provides a model, a very interesting uh, and moving model for producing a certain kind of architecture actually. Um, and I would call that kind of architecture an architecture of patient capital. And I'm referring that, uh, uh, in, in using that reference, um, I'm, I'm actually referring to a colleague of mine, uh, the architect Rahul Mirocha, who talks about 
the architecture of impatient capital. And that is the, that is the kind of architecture that we see uh, in the global cities. That's what's building uh, you know, Dubai and Shanghai and all of the other rapidly growing cities. And this is an example, uh, instead of the architecture of impatient capital that constantly needs uh, a return, this is, what, this, is, this is patient capital. This is an architecture of patient capital. Um, and I think that Naoshima is a real model for how architecture, uh, or an architecture that can play a role in regional revitalization, uh, can address environmental issues and social issues, and it can do that, and I think that's really important too, it can do that while it's also pushing the creative envelope of innovative design. And I think that's the really important uh, thing for architecture that's happening in Naoshima. Thank you.